It wasn't just safety or keeping kids safe. It was the appearance of it. You know, people can remain ignorant about what their real risks are and still have a lot of control over these things just in the, in the name of safety, but not real safety, just an illusion of it. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking today with Steve Templeton. He wrote a recent book, very relevant to the times, entitled Fear of a Microbial Planet, How a Germophobic Safety Culture Makes Us Less Safe. Yeah, well, it seems to me that a safety culture, all things considered, probably makes us globally less safe, but that seems particularly the case uh, in relationship, let's say, to germophobic safety culture, given what happened in the pandemic. So what, 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 what um, specifically motivated you to write this book? And when did you start writing it? What did you see happening? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me on your show, um, on your podcast. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. I've been a fan since 12 Rules for Life, so um, thanks so much for having me on. Um, but, you know, what originally happened was, just with anyone else, um, the pandemic uh, took me by shock, uh, surprise. I didn't uh, anticipate how we would respond to the pandemic. And and I didn't anticipate the appetite of, of people for um, being able to have their lives completely shut down and controlled um, by politicians and other people, public health experts. So I was really floored by the the type of response and the way that people were behaving. And it made me think, you know, they don't really have a an idea of their microbial environment. Um, because, you know, you're seeing things like people wearing masks outside. You're seeing playgrounds being shut down, um, hiking trails, uh, things like that, that there was absolutely no evidence that there'd be any sort of... Um, risk to those activities. And um, I was really floored by how widespread that was, you know, I mean, and people really bought into it. Um, you know, I saw some, a single child at a playground that was shut down. I mean, this was probably a teenager and someone came up and, and berated him um, for being on a playground by themselves when, after it had been shut down. So this type of behavior was really uh, eye-opening for me. It was something that I didn't expect. And I really started to think, why is this happening? Um, I know as uh, as an immunologist, um, there are going to be pandemics. This one particularly seemed to be um, age stratified in terms of mortality. Children weren't really affected. These were all things that we were known, that, kn that we knew very early on. And uh, I was, so I was really surprised by that response. I started thinking about um, how to how to explain it in, in a way that um, I could understand. So um, I've kind of been interested in writing a book, and um, this theme sort of kept popping into my head of, you know, all these things that weren't necessarily controversial three years ago, um, then all of a sudden became controversial. And uh, so that, that was kind of the impetus for, for writing the book. Well, it's it's interesting, eh? Because your your training is in immunology, but what you said, what what you're describing here, is the fact that you're actually struck by the social and the political response, psychological, social, and political response. And so, I've got a couple of questions about that. The first is, psychologists have started to outline, and and I don't know if this is research that overlaps with what you study. Uh, the operations of what's called, uh, be often called, sometimes called, the behavioral immune system. And I suppose part of the behavioral immune system is the disgust response, right? And it, it has a physiological basis. The gag reflex, for example, is part of that. The fact that poisons taste bitter to us, the fact that we can be, that we sneeze, um, the fact that disgust will evoke a uh, um, a defensive and avoidance reaction, the fact that we'll regard things as contaminated, those are all parts of the behavioral immune response. And 
One way of conceptualizing what happened with regard to the pandemic was that it was an you can get uh, an immune response that goes out of control like a cytokine storm, but this looked to me like it was the equivalent of a cytokine storm on the behavioral immune front. And what what does that does that what do you think of that line of theorizing? Does that strike you as plausible? Yeah, absolutely. So for first of all, I've written about um the connection, or at least the metaphor, of an immune response to our own pandemic response. Because in an immune response, things start out um, pretty nonspecific at first. Um, you have a lot of inflammation, you have a lot of tissue damage. But then uh, as, as it progresses, you get more of a specific or an adaptive response. And that is more um, you know, antibody cells that are more specific to any given pathogen. And there's a lot less collateral damage because of that specificity. And so you would, you would hope that a pandemic response would be like that. I mean, obviously, in the first few weeks, you're not going to know what you're dealing with. But the, as the pandemic spread through different populations, you got to see um, who the vulnerable people were, who wasn't affected, how transmissible it was, which was very highly transmissible. And uh, you would hope the, immune, the pandemic response would kind of look like that, um, like an immune response that was uh, successful in defeating a pathogen. But I thought it became more like an autoimmune response where we started attacking things that didn't matter, like schools um, and uh, issuing mandates um, without evidence that they were really going to uh, make a difference. And so um, I've used that metaphor before. Um, in terms of the behavioral immune response, I think that's it's a really interesting thing, and I've thought about it and written about it as well. Um, because obviously, if you're thinking about the fear uh, of this, being an immunologist, I had to delve into some psychology, which is another reason I'm fascinated to talk to you about this. But, uh, you know, the, the political um, sort of tribal conflict that we have here in, in the United States seems to override some of the, the studies on disgust, because you would think that based on studies, more people who are conservative would tend to be more easily disgusted. And that's been done in studies. Um, and, and, and early on in the pandemic, that was very um, much covered in the press because, um, you know, Donald Trump was is a germaphobe and everyone wanted to kind of talk about that. Um, uh, media people covered that a, a lot. Uh, but then it turned out that um, it cons people who are more conservative tended to reject mandates and, and uh, uh, coercive public health measures, whereas um, liberals were more likely to just buy all, into all of it and, and enforce it almost to the level of it you know, mm -hmm. being, being re a religion. And so I think that's really interesting yeah. um, that the, the sort of political considerations overrode that, the, that research. In, in well, so, okay, well, let, let's, let's walk down that road for a minute. So I did, my lab did some of the research on discuss sensitivity and conservatism. And we looked at it in relationship, for example, to trait conscientiousness, because there's some indication that conscientious people are more disgust sensitive. Now, and, and it was striking that, as you pointed out, that what you might have predicted to begin with um, and there, there's also a fair bit of research. I can't, unfortunately, remember the the, the uh, researcher's name at the moment, but I had him on my podcast, who's documented quite clearly the relationship between contamination, the prevalence of contaminants, transmissible contaminants, state by state and country by country, and the probability that especially right-wing authoritarian beliefs will arise culturally and and individually, and the relationship is quite tight. But as you said, it looked like it was the left in particular that was gung-ho about, um, about the lockdowns, even more so than the conservatives, although they were also complicit. Now, but what seems to have emerged recently, there's, there's another line of psychological research that bears on this. And so for 70 years, psychologists denied the existence of left-wing authoritarianism. And I'm going to lay that denial at the feet of social psychologists because I believe that they turned a blind eye to left-wing authoritarianism 100% for political reasons. 
although it might also be because some of them were also left-wing authoritarians. But there's been a new line of research developed, and there's probably only about 10 studies in total. Um, we did one in 2016 before my research career came to an abrupt end. First of all, establishing that left-wing authoritarianism was identifiable on statistical grounds, but then second, looking at the predictors. We found low verbal intelligence and being female and having a feminine temperament were solid predictors of left, radical left-wing beliefs combined with the willingness to use compulsion and force to enforce them. But more recently, people have been examining the role played by dark tetrad traits, so Machiavellianism, psychopathy, narcissism, and sadism, which is an, an, a late addition to that horrible triad, let's say, showing, I read one study last week showing that the relationship between the dark, that malignant narcissism and left-wing authoritarianism was so strong that they're almost indistinguishable on the measurement front. And so I wonder if what we saw wasn't so much a disgust reaction of the sort that you would associate with conservatives, but an opportunity for malignant narcissists to use fear to manipulate the population, to put themselves in positions of power. And like your book, you make that case, you know, to, to fair degree, because you concentrate not so much on disgust, but on fear, and then on well, and on, on the machinations that were used by people who manipulated fear to gain notoriety and political power. In Canada, I'll give you one other example. So in Canada, I know for a fact, because I've been told by the people who were involved, even though they were embarrassed to have been a part of it, that virtually all the COVID lockdown policies were implemented on the basis of opinion polls and then pro provided with a post hoc justification with the science, right? So it was 100% instrumental manipulation. So anyways, that's, that's a set of ideas. Yeah, I think that it, you can reduce it maybe to, instead of left and right, authoritarian um, versus non-authoritarian. And I think that that's what what you said is is correct i think the level of authoritarianism has changed um between left and right in in recent years and uh and that's because the amount of relative power i think has changed i mean um you know when i, I grew up in the 80s and i remember um you know censorship drives and you know music was being attacked and everyone was joking about it and um cuz conservatives wanted to censor things and um, you know, none of that really happens anymore. It's kind of the other way around where um, people can't joke about certain things and they have to demonstrate how um, virtuous they are in sort of a, a left-wing kind of way. So I think that you can reduce it to um, changes in authoritarianism, definitely. Yeah, well, it's still, it's still uncertain the degree to which Let's say we could make the hypothesis that oversensitivity to disgust will drive an authoritarian response on the right. You, you definitely saw that in the Third Reich under the Nazis because Hitler, for example, appeared to be extremely disgust sensitive. And I read a fair bit of his spontaneous utterances about the Jews and all the other people who persecuted. And he used the language of purity and contempt and disgust constantly. It wasn't the language of fear. I mean, he, he did, you know, foster fear, let's say, in relationship to the people he targeted. But more specifically, he fostered disgust. And so maybe, and, and no one knows if this is the case, maybe a disgust reaction that goes overboard fosters at least part of right-wing authoritarianism and the dark tetrad, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and sadism fosters something like radical left-wing authoritarianism. No one's cleared that up yet, but it seems, it seems at least tentatively plausible. I mean, I was struck by the recent research in particular because the relationship between malignant narcissism and left-wing authoritarianism is, authoritarianism is unbelievably strong. I haven't seen correlations. Correlations, I think, were 0.6. 
crazily high correlations for, for two constructs that can't be measured that accurately. So, well, so it'd be good, it'd be good to sort that all out as rapidly as we possibly could, uh, assuming it would do some good. Yeah, I agree. It's pretty complicated. The use of, uh, of fear was very, uh, is going back to what you said a little bit earlier, was definitely widespread. And I think at the beginning, it's, it's interesting to look at the, the contrasting messages that were given by the authorities. It, it, in the beginning, they really were trying to prevent panic, and they were really trying to uh, lessen the fear of people because um, you know, studies have shown if you, if you are anticipating in a pandemic, it's actually the fear is higher than when it has actually arrived. So um, that many of the messages were, were calming, and then uh, you know, all of a sudden there was this switch. And um, you know, once there was community spread, we knew that there was a lot of a virus in, in around that hadn't wasn't being detected. Um, then there it was this sort of mysterious switch to uh, basically the exact opposite, this fear-based messaging. And uh, yeah, so that that was uh, really surprising to me and and uh, and pretty infuriating because I knew it wasn't going to to work. Yeah, well, maybe maybe what happened is that. Maybe that reversal took place when the more narcissistic, psychopathic power mongerers started to understand that they could cement their positions and broaden them with the use of fear. You, you mentioned earlier, I thought this was very interesting, you mentioned earlier that in an immune response that is actually healthy, you get kind of flailing about on the part of the immune system to begin with as it attempts to get a purchase on the virus or the bacteria. And so you get an overgeneralized response that's not very specific and sophisticated, but as the system, immune system learns, the response gets more and more targeted and more specific, and that you saw the opposite happen in the public response. And that begs the question, right? What, why, what drove the op opposite response? Like the opposite of learning. And the we want to accrue power to ourselves narrative and we'll use fear to do it does seem to, does seem to fit, fit the explanatory bill, let's say. Yeah, that's the that's the million dollar question is, is is how did that happen? And my explanation of thinking about this, um, because you know it, it it happened a lot in Western countries, um, many many Western countries, but it didn't happen everywhere. And so um, what I started to think about was, um, you know, I'm I'm a parent of have a child that's eleven and one that's seven. They were obviously three years younger when the pandemic hit, but. Being a parent, I've really noticed uh, since I was a child this sort of emergence of um, safety as this sort of overriding virtue of all the the you know th taking risks as being uh, something that's left to reckless people, um, and you can't even um, use sort of probability to assess whether something is risky or not if it's determined to be risky, then it's hazardous. And so I think the distinctions that used to be um, sort of surrounding child rearing have, in terms of allowing them to um, develop on their own and, and, uh, and take risks and, you know, get injured if they make a mistake or, you know, fail, um, you know, a lot of that has been uh, removed. And I feel like um, this sort of, this example really leads us to the the uh, response to the pandemic. I feel like it's it's a cultural um, problem because if you look at places that don't have this very strong safety culture, um, Nordic countries are a great example. Um, they did not have the same type of authoritarian response that we did in, in, in Europe and other Western countries, specifically, you know, Anglosphere countries, Canada, United States, UK. Australia, New Zealand. Um, they didn't have that, and they actually don't have a, uh, a safety culture that's the same. I mean, I heard a story when I was in Denmark a few years ago, and um, it's been, it was covered widely at the time about uh, parents that went to New York City, and they, uh, these were Danish parents. They brought their child in a stroller, and they had, and in Denmark, it was very common at the time to, 
leave their child in a stroller outside the restaurant so that they could watch people that you know are passing by, and uh, um, they got arrested uh, for doing that in New York City. And so um, that was something brought up by my host in in Denmark. It was really interesting that you know their they their view of raising children is is different than ours. Um, they believe much more in um, challenging them, allowing them to make their own decisions. And so I, I really think that, that that explained a lot. And that's how I get to the, the point of having the safety culture in the title or in the subtitle uh, is because of, of that explanation. I mean, anyone who's been uh, a parent has had to deal with or had to deal with like public schools. I mean, you know, the threshold for canceling school, uh, even before the pandemic got you know, got pretty low. I mean, they're even now they even predict snow in Indiana here. They cancel school. It could n- never actually snow. So, um, so these things are, are much different than when when I was uh, a kid. And I feel like that has, you know, as children have been raised that way and are now adults, now young adults, um, I, I have a feeling that that is is one way to explain what happened. Are you looking for an all-in-one e-commerce platform that can help you easily set up and grow your business online? Look no further than Shopify. With Shopify, you can quickly and easily build your own online store, manage your inventory, and accept payments from customers. Plus, Shopify offers a range of customizable themes and templates to choose from, so you can create a professional-looking store without any design experience. It even helps integrate with other popular tools to help you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. With Shopify's 24-7 support and an extensive business course library that is available to support you every step of the way, Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. If you're ready to get serious about selling, try Shopify today. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash jbp. Go to shopify.com slash jbp to take your business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash jbp. Yeah, well, there is some psychological research pertaining to that that's associated with some of the things we've discussed already, which is that mothers who have cluster B personality pathology, and so that would be associated with what's called externalizing behavior and in women, it's borderline personality disorder, for example, are much less likely to foster independence in their children. And so, and that cluster B is also associated with some of the dark tetrad traits that we discussed, that malignant narcissism, that psychopathy, Machiavellianism, sadism, you know, perhaps is pushing it, but perhaps not. No, because... The, the, the question, of course, is why does that safety culture emerge? And you can attribute some of that to neuroticism, to fear, but you can also attribute it to the willingness of hyperprotective parents to use their purported concern for the security of their children to justify their use of excessive power and control. You know, and, and this is part of the reason why your book and the title of your book is is interesting and the tack you're taking on this, right? Because you are looking at the nexus between the use of fear and the justification for power. And the safety culture, it's got that virtue signaling element, right? Which which is extremely dangerous. It's like, well, listen, dear, the reason I'm doing this for you is because I care so much about you. And all I really care is about your, let's say, short-term security. And it's hard to argue against that because, of course, safety is a paramount concern or an important concern when you're dealing with children. But the problem is that it can be gamed by people who want to exert power and who can use their putative moral superiority as a justification. And I do think this, this, is, this is a kind of epidemic. I guess a, a question I would have for you, too, is like, I'm increasingly bothered by the fact that we even refer to a pandemic. You know, J. Bhattacharya, no, Ioannidis, Ioannidis, who's a very good uh, statistician and and researcher. Uh, I mean, he was the person who initiated the so-called 
replication crisis in psychology, showing that so much of psychological research actually didn't replicate, not that it's necessarily worse in other disciplines. But he just published a paper, or has published papers, showing that the, the case fatality rate for COVID is way lower than we had been led to believe. In fact, it's so low, I think, that you could argue that there wasn't a pandemic at all in some real sense. And you see this echoed in the Swedish data, because if you, I believe, if you average out the death rate over a two-year period, there's no statistical blip in deaths in Sweden during the so-called COVID years. And so I think our terminology for what happened during that time might also be deeply wrong and that what we had was an, we had an epidemic of tyrannical lockdown with a, with a putative novel illness. Well, the illness was novel, but a putative pandemic as the, as the excuse. Now, maybe that's too radical, but I'm not sure it is too radical. You know, it, it certainly was a disease that I think the Israel, the Israelis recently announced, if I remember correctly, that they didn't have any deaths at all for people under 50 who had fewer than four comorbidities. It's something like that. And so, like, do you think it's completely preposterous to proclaim that we didn't have a pandemic at all? except one of tyranny? Yeah, I've, I would say we had a pandemic, but, um, uh, you know, the, the response was, was something that we really, uh, really blew and didn't, you know, focus on the people who were actually affected. I mean, if you have a population of people who are average of 81 of people who are dying, um, that's going to be actually pretty difficult to measure in terms of you know excess deaths, and because a lot of people in that age group and with comorbidities, um, if you have a pandemic that lasts two years, um, the chances of many of those folks living two years is is much lower than it is in populations of say young people. So um, the ability to measure that um, becomes more difficult when you're dealing with an old and or frail or infirm population. I think. Well, that's especially true too. If you if you then purposefully confuse dying with COVID with dying from COVID, which clearly happened, right? And I mean, I talked to physicians who said that they were instructed by their well, their professional organizations. They were encouraged by their professional organizations to list any death with COVID as a death from COVID. And God only knows how that gerrymandered the statistics. And I think it was the London Times, even the Times now, um, reported two days ago on the fact that all the evidence in the UK suggests that the costs to the lockdown were orders of magnitude above the costs that were actually associated with the biological pathogen itself, right? They're not even in the same league. It's not like the lockdowns were a little worse than the virus. They were stunningly worse than the virus. And, and we haven't even seen all the accruing catastrophe that's emerged from that yet. Um, uh, I, I mean, I don't know what to make of the excess death statistics, for example, that that just don't seem to go away. And do you do you have any thoughts on that matter? Meaning, you know, in the last few years, we have more excess deaths. Yeah, yeah, than, yeah. Well, yeah. well, even even right now, it doesn't like right. the, the, the excess deaths in Europe are between fifteen and twenty percent, something like that, ten and twenty percent above normal, and that doesn't seem to be going away. And right. you know, I think the simplest explanation for that is that. We hurt people very badly with the lockdowns. But then the, the other open question is, is there some degree to which the actual vaccines are contributing to this? And, you know, that's an absolutely horrifying possibility, but I don't think it's off the table statistically at the moment. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the vaccines were very promising for people who were in that vulnerable age group. But... Uh, you know, what happened was uh, politics uh, took over, especially here, and uh, mandates, uh, in addition to uh, removing all liability from uh, the vaccines themselves, which had been tested minimally um, and not necessarily on the population you'd want to test them on, that is, older and infirm people. 
Um, they were minimally tested. And so, you know, for an emergency, um, you'd want to focus on the vulnerable population because that would where the biggest benefit would, uh, would be obvious. But that didn't happen. Um, I believe that there was a lot of influence from pharmaceutical companies um, acting upon government agencies. And um, their incentives were actually not to promote actual public health of people here in the United States. And I'm sure in the UK and Canada, it was exactly the same. There was outside influences. The same is true for, you know, just counting COVID deaths. If you provide an incentive to overcount, if you give hospitals more money for COVID patients, um, whether they're, and if they're on a ventilator or their type of treatment, you're providing an incentive for those um, hospitals and healthcare providers to um, increase those numbers so that they can increase their profits. And um, these are just, it's just a matter of incentives. Giving people uh, perverse incentives is gonna lead to perverse outcomes. And, uh, and I think that's exactly what happened. When you started writing this book, when you started observing the, what was happening around you, how would you characterize your political stance? Because people are, who are listening are going to be wondering, and, and I think it's a reasonable thing to wonder, what, how your a priori political stance might have formed the lens through which you were viewing what was laying itself out. How would, how would you have characterized your political views, let's say, five years ago, and how would you characterize them now? Uh, I've always been a, uh, you know, I've been in academia for a long time. I was in, uh, you know, graduate school for a while and here in Indiana for about 12 years. So um, being around other scientists, being around other people in universities and medical schools, um, I was never, you know, the the most, I was not a liberal person in, in um, relation to my peers in that way. Um, if you put me in a room of um, people who are hardcore, you know, Trump supporters, um, I wouldn't fit in with that that group either. So, um, you know, I haven't actually, you know, voted for someone who's won an election in a very long time. So um, if that gives you an idea, um, I, I would probably say I was a center right. Um, but one of the things that this really became associated with, anyone who's willing to speak up, it uh, there was this fear that you'd be automatically put into this camp of, you know, well, you're doing this for political reasons, you're doing this because you support Trump or something like that. Um, and I really encountered that both from um, friends and acquaintances that were, uh, and even people just on social media that I didn't know, but, uh, you know, that were liberal, they would assume that I was, you know, a hardcore right-wing Trump supporter. And even Trump supporters would assume that, which... Um, you know, when it comes to closing schools, um, this became so politicized that even wanting op to open schools um, became a sign that, you know, you didn't want to necessarily agree with Trump on something. And, uh, and that, was, that was really unfortunate. I heard this firsthand from people that I talked to. It's not something that I, I anticipated really at all because um, I've lived in a world where a lot of people I know and like, uh, you know, disagree with me. Um, my wife and I disagree on a lot of things, and uh, and I'm used to that. But this is kind of the world where that we're in now, where that's not those kind of disagreements are are not allowed, and discussion and debate are shut down. Yeah, well, the question I guess one of the questions that we might want to address today is what do we think we could do to make sure that the next time this happens, assuming there is a next time, we're not quite so insane about it. And I would say also, what could we learn so that we don't respond the same way to other hypothetical crises that confront us because I feel that we could do precisely the same thing and that there are many people hoping this will happen in some real sense, that we could do exactly the same thing, for example, on the climate doom front. And, you know, the more paranoid conspiratorial types have, have presumed that this was just a warm-up for that, but I have a certain degree of sympathy for their concerns given what happened. Now, you start your book out Part one of your book is fear and germs. And one of the things you do to begin with is to lay out a little bit of background for people about the nature of the microbial environment that we do find ourselves in, right? So that you can, I suppose, you can give people some sense of 
how much the relative risk increased because of the introduction of this new pathogen. Do you want to walk us through that a bit? Yeah, so I use my uh, my oldest sister as an example of a, of a germaphobe because she was um, a nurse in a cardiac surgical team. And, you know, obviously her job was very much involved um, being very diligent about preventing infections in patients. And so um, I think that sort of translated into, you know, she brought that home and um, became very diligent about avoiding infections and sanitizing and, you know, any sort of exposure to germs. She became sort of interested in um, and obsessed with um, dealing with. And so I use her as an example, and I talk about how, um, you know, that, that way of thinking is not not helpful because we're in we're already in a microbial world and we're exposed to all sorts of things. We have you know at least ten viruses latently infected in, in our system in our body at, at any given time, um, possibly more. Um, and that's not counting viruses that infect the bacteria that inhabit us, which are um, astronomically high numbers. Um, so I kind of lay out um, just how much. Uh, exposure we have to microbes that we don't realize. Um, and, uh, you know, what, it's just everywhere in the environment and it's not um, something you can avoid. And then I talk about, you know, although that's the case, there are definitely instances where we've become very clean and uh, our ability to avoid microbial exposures has resulted in some um, first world diseases um, like increased autoimmunity, um, increased allergy, uh, asthma, those type of things. These are all first world diseases. You don't see them in developing countries at nearly the same prevalence that you see here and in Canada and UK and other places. So um, I talk about why that is, and mainly it's because we're not exposed to the same level of um, environmental microbes, or even pathogens that we used to be um, because of obviously huge gains that we had from sanitation revolution. Um, we don't want to go back to that, but something has definitely been lost. And, uh, you know, I give many examples of, of that, you know, uh, in terms of pandemics. Um, polio is an example where polio was endemic for a very long time um, until sanitation approved, improved to the point where people weren't being exposed to polio until they were older, and then it became a lot more severe and noticeable in, you know, when you're talking about older children as opposed to a baby who's nursing, who just has a mild infection, and their mother breastfeeds and helps them clear the virus. So, um, you know, that was an example of a trade-off. Uh, and so um, I wanted to sort of highlight that all of these things were trade-offs, and, you know, people have been, this hasn't been controversial um, at all for a long time. Whether you're feeling stressed, anxious, or simply seeking a moment of peace and tranquility, the Hallow app has something for you. Hallow offers an incredible range of guided meditations and prayers that are designed to help you deepen your spirituality and strengthen your connection to God. With Hallow, you can explore different themes and types of prayer and meditation, such as gratitude, forgiveness, and centering prayer. You can also choose from different lengths of meditation to fit your schedule, whether you have a few minutes or an hour. With its user-friendly interface and hundreds of guided meditations, the Hallow app has quickly become a go-to resource for people seeking spiritual growth and healing. Download the app for free at hallow.com Jordan. You can set prayer reminders and track your progress along the way. Hallow is truly transformative and will help you connect with your faith on a deeper level. So what are you waiting for? Download the Hallow app today at hallow.com slash Jordan. That's hallow.com slash Jordan. Once again, it's hallow.com slash Jordan for an exclusive three-month free trial of all 6,000 plus prayers and meditations. There's no reason to aim for something like zero microbial exposure because right. that's completely preposterous. And so I think if I remember correctly, in terms of sheer cell number, I think you have more bacteria in your body than cells. Now they happen to be very, very tiny, but it gives you some, that gives the listeners and watchers, let's say some indication of just exactly how prevalent, as you said, the microbial load is. And then do you have any sense of 
what actually constitutes, let's say, reasonable precautions. You don't want to sterilize everything in sight, partly because maybe you make your immune system hyper responsive if you're overprotected, but obviously we don't want to return to the filth of the, the centuries prior to the 20th century where, well, well, where people were dying of infectious diseases at an incredible rate, especially in hospitals, let's say. So what, and, and I don't imagine you made yourself particularly popular with your older sister, by the way, um, using her as an example, but, but um, so what, what, do you, what do you think of as a reasonable response to, you know, to, to cleanliness, given the necessity of minimizing both kind of error? Yeah, so, um, you know, certain viruses are pretty nasty and cause really awful infections in, in people. But it turns out that in, in a general sense, the, the nastier the, the virus, the harder it is, tr is to transmit it. And so there's sort of a, an association between the ability to transmit something and then the severity of the disease that it, it transmits. And so if you take something like HIV, it's a nasty um, infection, uh, has a very long um, period where there's not a lot of, of symptoms, but then um, becomes very uh, awful in terms of destruction of the immune system leading to opportunistic infections. However, you can avoid getting HIV um, for the most part, unless you have some sort of accidental exposure directly to your blood, um, which, do, which did happen, but has been um, you know, greatly reduced. The same thing is true about something like hepatitis. Um, you know, these are nasty infections, but you don't necessarily get um, them from just being in contact with other people. In terms of respiratory infections, um, those are much more harder to avoid because they are um, very easily transmissible. Um, they have a lot of genetic variability. Um, and uh, so the immune system is able to, might be able to prevent severe disease, um, but not the actual infection itself. So, um, you know, there are some viruses that you want to avoid and some that you really can't. Um, and and people should kind of understand the distinction between that. Yeah, well, the, the rationale was, uh, I think once that became obvious, that the rationale was, well, if we slowed the rate at which it spread, we wouldn't overwhelm the hospital systems. And, you know, one of the things I saw in Canada that was particularly remarkably uh, dim and pathological was that the governments took almost no actions whatsoever to increase the availability of emergency, of intensive care unit, uh, in intensive care units, which was seemed, at least at the time, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, seemed like the logical thing to do, especially after this extended over a multi-year period. I mean, we knew, how early did we know that virtually everybody was going to get COVID? You said, as, as you pointed out, respiratory illnesses are transmissible and there isn't really a damn thing you can do about it. Yeah, I mean, the the response was, was much, very much like uh, you know, a behavioral modification was absolutely necessary and everyone had to ch completely change their behavior. Um, and, in, and that sort of did not consider the, the length of time that was going to be necessary um, and the fact that, you know, the whole world doesn't operate that way. We're so interconnected. Um, you know, you'd read articles about um, how I would read them and think, you know, people would talk about, yeah, just get groceries delivered and, um, you know, you don't have to leave your house. And But somebody somewhere is going to have to leave their house in order to support that. And uh, um, these things weren't really thought out. And, uh, you know, as a result, um, in some cases it could be delayed but not completely um, eliminated by behavioral modifications. Yeah, well, when you say they're not completely thought out, I mean, I, I think that's what you might say, that's the understatement of the decade. I, I watched recently a viral video of the new CDC director talking about how she made the decision to lock down football. And she, 
is giggling while she's saying this, which is appalling beyond comprehension. And it, it doesn't really seem to me to be a nervous giggle. It's more like, a, well, isn't this cute? It's so funny that this is the way it happened. She talks about talking to one of the health officials in Massachusetts and just sort of bandying back and forth ideas about who should be locked down next. In this case, it was anybody who wanted to go watch football game. And that kind of random scattershot approach to depriving people of their civil liberties seemed to be par for the course. And this particular video is an incredibly egregious example of that because it combines an idiot cutesiness with this terrible proclivity to, well, to really deprive people of their fundamental mobility rights, you know, except for the expendable people, let's say, who are doing the grocery deliveries. And there was a really nasty element to that as well, is that, you know, the important people could stay at home and lock themselves up and protect themselves, but the expendable working class could go about their business as usual. Right. I mean, there are all sorts of, of exceptions too, right? So, I mean, if there, there were lots of videos of, um, you know, where, I don't know what the, the video version of a hot mic is, but where, you know, um, officials would know that they were off camera or think that they were off camera, and you could see them immediately take their masks off, you know, because... Um, they're s truly believing that this is something they have to perform to show for people. Um, and they don't necessarily believe that it's, it's going to be 100% effective um, in, in, in reality. And so there were lots of, of examples of that where people didn't actually believe um, what they were saying. I mean, when there were protests, um, there, were, there were lots of public health people that said, you know, protesting racism is, is public health necessity or something like that. And um, a, lot of, a lot of people rightfully identified that as, as, as just being completely based on nonsense. I mean, um, the idea that, you know, yeah, well, the same thing things... happened with COP26 in, in the UK, right? So yeah. it wasn't just like Black Lives Matter protests. It was also climate change meetings. Yeah. The, the UK government completely inverted its rules to allow the delegates to the climate change uh, conference to proceed apace with no restrictions, because apparently that was what the important people got to do, whereas ordinary people who were going about their lives weren't able to continue. And one of the things we did see, and, and this is going to have extraordinary long-term consequences, is that there was a massive transfer of wealth from the, like, essentially working class and lower middle class business owners who got demolished by the pandemic restrictions to huge retailers like Amazon. And once those little businesses are gone and many of them disappeared, it's very hard to get them back. And so, and I don't know, you know, I don't know how you count up that kind of collateral damage when you're trying to derive the statistics about exactly what the pandemic lockdowns cost us because the toll that took on families, well, there was no one even interested in measuring that, I suppose, in some fundamental sense. Yeah, I mean, you could not put a single number on it because there's so many areas of life uh, that are affected by it. I mean, healthcare in a way of um, treatment of cancer, treatment of heart attacks, um, screenings, that kind of diagnostic tests, all of these things were um, completely eliminated. Um, people who were... Um, dependent on communities, um, Alcoholics Anonymous, that kind of thing. All those things were shut down. Um, and some people needed that to survive and were unable to, to continue something that, would have, that kept them in a healthier state than they would be otherwise. And so this sort of singular COVID mono, monomania was, is, is so damaging in so many areas. And, you know, you see it, um, every day there's some some news that comes out, you know, of the kids, you know, BMI has doubled, you know, and uh, um, retention rates are still low in terms of kids staying in school, even, you know, three years after the pandemic and uh, test scores. Right, right. And a huge and number of kids never, re a huge number of kids never returned to school. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, there's, Studies have shown that uh, even three months of disruption in a child's education can affect their uh, long-term, you know, ability to uh, um, 
earn money and make a living and, uh, you know, to have this happen on kind of a global scale, people who are already in, in, in a poverty type situation are going to be forced further into that, into that than they would be otherwise. And so it's going to be so pervasive that it's going to be very difficult to, to measure. But we're seeing so much of it um, in terms of, of other health care costs, um, inflation, all that stuff. This is all very related to, to what happened. Well, there's an inter- another interesting political issue here, too, that's, I guess, relevant to the use of fear and also to some of the topics we discussed earlier. So one of the things I found that was virtually miraculous in terms of its incomprehensibility was the fact that people, particularly on the left, lined up on the side of the pharmaceutical companies. And if, if you would have told me 10 years, that, 10 years ago that left-wing politicos and believers would have aligned themselves with pharmaceutical companies, I would have thought you were completely out of your mind because the bugbear of the left, the bugbears of the left on the corporate front for the last 60 years likely have been oil companies and pharmaceutical companies, you know, and, and with some justification, especially in the latter category. And yet, there was this unholy alliance between the left-wing authoritarians and the pharmaceutical companies, and I can't help but think that that's likely mediated by this association, heretofore un, unexamined association between psychopathy, narcissism, Machiavellianism, sadism, and the desire for power. Because one of the things that aligning with the pharmaceutical companies did for the power-mongering left was, um, what would you say, justify their, their willingness to use power to compel and force people. And I can't find another explanation because it's so, it runs so counter to what you would assume the leftist narrative would be because the, of all the people who should be skeptical of gigantic pharmaceutical corporations, you'd think the leftists would be number one. So I don't know if you've had any thoughts about that. Yeah, absolutely. So. You would think that, um, you know, with the sort of natural distrust of big business and pharmaceutical companies that has historically been on the left, um, combine that with the distrust of um, the ability of government um, on the right to, to take over uh, massive projects, um, uh, subsidize economies, take you know, regulate all healthcare and things like that. Um, you think that there would be some bipartisan consensus there, but that wasn't the case at all. Um, and I think you know, for certain people, um, this this benefited them um, to um, sort of push the uh, this, they they shared the same inter- interests with pharmaceutical companies. Um, uh, people who were were in power, and even if that didn't mesh with their political beliefs in the past, the the uh, promise of gaining power and influence uh, was simply, you know, too much to. It, it it basically overrode that that traditional stance. So so in the first part of your book, you you talk a fair bit about fear and germs, and and. You, you try to make a case for what the proper relationship might be between a fear response and the, say, the overwhelming prevalence of, of the microbial uh, biome around us. In the second part of your book, you concentrate more on a pandemic in the time of safety. So maybe we should delve into that a little bit more. I don't feel that you've, you've had the opportunity to develop your hypothesis about the relationship between the safety culture and the planning and pandemic planning thoroughly. Do you want you one of your chapters six is pandemic planning meets the safety culture. Seven is all the doom we need and the face badge of virtue. Do you want to delve into that a little bit more and elaborate that for the for everybody who's watching and listening? Right. Yeah. So the first part of that is sort of the realization that um, you know the safety culture is is enabled. Um, a lot of this this to happen. Um, a lot of people like to, you know, ascribe the the whole pandemic response and all the bad things that happened to, you know, a select few, you know, supervillains out there. And while I am 
uh, sure that lots of people took uh, advantage of the situation in sort of odious ways. Um, I didn't feel like um, that's just not my nature to to think in the sort of conspiratorial terms and blame a small you know cabal of of uh, supervillains on on uh, the the whole pandemic response. Um, but instead, I feel like there was a cultural problem that enabled all of this. And I, I could see it in some of the things, even on a local level. Um, one example I give is um, when when my daughter was probably about two years old, she uh, got what's called hand, foot, and mouth disease. And her day, daycare, her day, and it, hand, foot, and mouth disease is one of these things where if it gets into like a daycare, it's not going to get out until everybody gets it and gets over it, and who's susceptible at least. And adults, daycare workers can get it and have very mild or no symptoms and still be able to transmit it um, to others. It's passed through the stool. And so if you're in a daycare and you've got toddlers and babies, um, it's nearly impossible to keep that clean and to prevent spread. Once it's there, it's going to spread. And, but it's very um, it's sort of innocuous. This gives children, it makes them very uncomfortable. They can't eat. They have sores in their mouth. Um, they have sores in their body. They have a fever for a few days. But then it goes away. And sometimes it takes a while for, you know, the spots on their body to heal. And uh, what the daycare was telling us is that um, my daughter had to stay home until uh, she was completely healed, which um, was opposite of what, you know, had been, people had been told about hand, foot, and mouth disease for a very long time. It was generally, you know, and what the American Academy of Pediatrics said was that after they've had fever, uh, a day later they can go back to school or daycare or whatever. Um, but instead, we were, we were told to be, um, you know, to keep our kid home and, you know, continue to pay for daycare and um, until... Her, all of her lesions were completely healed. And, uh, you know, that wouldn't have made anyone safer. I mean, this um, was that obviously she got the virus at the daycare, which means it was in the daycare. It was going to be spread. Lots of kids were going to get it. Um, and, and it's just going to blow through the daycare and, until it was done. Um, and so keeping her home would have been absolutely, had zero uh, effect on the spread in the daycare. But at the same time, the local health department um, backed up what the uh, the daycare owner said um, and, and said that she should she should stay home for two weeks, um, even though our pediatrician agreed with us based on what the American Academy of Pediatrics said. So I mean, I went directly to the health department and talked to the the uh, head of the health department, and you know she was basically unapologetic, and I really thought. Um, later, I really thought later on that, you know, this this way of thinking um, could be translated into how we thought about the pandemic response. And it wasn't just safety or keeping kids safe. It was the appearance of it um, that was important. And so I have a, um, a chapter called Hurting Children for the Appearance of Safety. And that's, you know, one of the things that that really bothered me as a parent, not just an immunologist or um, infectious disease scientist. Um, the ability of, uh, uh, you know, people can remain ignorant about what their real risks are and still have a lot of control about um, over these things just in the, in the name of safety, but not real safety, just an illusion of it. It seems to me that, you know, your chapter nine, hurting children for the appearance of safety, for the appearance of safety. Part of the question there is, well, why would people be concerned about the appearance of safety? And I think part of the reason for that is that people like to use their concern for children and for other vulnerable people, let's say, as a way of signaling just exactly how morally virtuous they are. It's, it's a real demonstrative performance of look how much I care. And it also gives you the opportunity, if you do that, not only to elevate your moral virtue as a consequence of doing that in an unearned way, but to demonize anybody that would stand in the way, which is also convenient if what you're trying to do is to accrue power. 
you know, you told the story about your daycare. When when you were in the midst of that, was was your what was your personal reaction? I mean, how did you how did you find yourself responding to the demands that the daycare was making on you and your wife, your family? Yeah. Given that you knew that their actual factual concerns were unwarranted. Yeah, well, I would think that, you know, I had some sort of relevant knowledge um, that could affect um, the outcome of this. It actually helped other parents because, um, you know, this was obviously going to come up. Other kids were going to get um, the infection because it's highly contagious. Um, and kids can transmit it for weeks after their symptoms have resolved. So um, even when you know, the spots had completely healed, she could still give it to other kids. And so um, I wanted the other parents to understand that this had really no basis in, in, in making their kids safer. There was no argument that could be made. And I would think that that would have had an effect on the, the owner of the daycare didn't a, at all. Um, in fact, we ended up getting booted from that daycare. But um, that, experience, that experience was, uh, I think, you know, really set up, it helps set up the, the pandemic response because there's something has changed in the culture where um, we don't accept any sort of risk. We want, we want risk to be completely minimized away um, until there's none, which is many cases not possible. Um, and if that isn't possible, then we want to pretend that we can do that. And, uh, and the illusion of, of, of control, the illusion of being able to, to eliminate any sort of risk um, is, becomes very attractive uh, for people. And, and any sort of leader or official politician, whatever, um, it becomes a very easy sell when people are afraid, and uh, and and that's kind of the way that I that I set set up all this uh, safety culture um, explanation for how we responded. So, Steve, you said something rather ruefully um, and interestingly to me that you and your child got the boot from that particular daycare, and so you know that that perked up my clinical ears, let's say, because that seems to me to be a perfectly logical extension of exactly what happened if we're using the power-mongering theory here a bit. What, what happened exactly there and, and what did that, what, 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 did you, what did you derive from that? What moral did you derive from that? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I basically contacted all the other parents um, in an email chain and told them why this was not um, making any of their children safer, and uh, you know, the none of them really responded saying you know thank you or anything like that. Um, it was more the daycare owner saying you know you don't have a right to do that, and um, we don't want you to come back after your daughter is better. So, um, on was, what uh, grounds? On what I, grounds exactly? Well, I mean, that was kind of a, a, a personality thing too, um, that uh, that we had we had discovered before with other other issues. So um, I don't think that's necessarily um, a cultural thing. However, I do think what the the health department did and the way that they responded, um, agreeing with the daycare owner, they would have no other reason to um, support her other than the fact that um, they've sort of been conditioned to be overcautious and in ways that wouldn't actually make people safer. And that was, uh, you know, ultimately how I made that connection once people started behaving in a way, treating children like they were disease vectors. I mean, the way that my kids were treated at school, even in a place like Indiana, which you wouldn't think would be, um, you know, like Portland or um, San Francisco, um, the way that they were treated, even, even in the public schools in my area, um, was just completely unnecessary and not based on evidence um, at all. And um, so my futility of dealing with the, the daycare situation was kind of a, a harbinger of my futility to deal with anything in the uh, local area in terms of trying to quell uh, 
panic or irrational or non-evidence-based responses and the way that children were treated more specifically. So let me throw out a couple of hypotheses at you with regards to the prevalence of this safety culture. So here's five different reasons perhaps why it's become more prevalent. So one would be people have children much later than they used to. So instead of having children in their early 20s, they have their children in their early 30s. And so that means that in some ways, they're grandparents by the time they have children, rather than the normal age for human beings to have children. And I suspect that makes them less risk tolerant because younger people are wilder and more impulsive. And obviously there's a downside to that, but God only knows what the upside is. Then the next problem, hypothetically, might be that, well, you know, if you have six kids, you're just not going to be able to exercise that much control over them because they outnumber you terribly and you're exhausted and you're going to just let the tribe go out and do like tribal things. And you're going to chase them the hell out of the house because, you know, enough kids. But if you have one, well, then you have all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. And so, and the child is also not being challenged and provoked by his or her siblings in that constant manner that might have been the case more likely when there were more siblings. And then also parents are richer now. And so that means that they can dote in a way that would have been practically impossible before. And then additionally, like we did find, for example, in the study that I cited to you at the beginning of our discussion, that one of the predictors of left-wing authoritarianism was being female and also having a female temperament. It was quite a strong predictor and quite a surprising predictor. And there are a lot more female-dominated families and institutions now than there were 40 years ago. I mean, there's lots of single mother families. And then in schools, of course, the vast preponderance of teachers are female. And so, well, there's five reasons why the safety culture might have become increasingly paramount. So I don't know if you, have you, have you thought through at all and, 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 and written about why you think that culture has become more predominant? I mean, we obviously have talked about its dangers. Yeah. Well, to think about some of the things that you said, um, with the size of families, I mean, and the age that people are having children, um, that certainly might have something to do with it. If you look at places like where I live, um, they, so in, in, in the United States, there are a lot of different areas where the average age that um, someone, a family, desire, decides to have children is different. Um, here, it's probably much lower, and I know it's much lower than it is on the coasts. Um, and so there are lots of families here where, um, you know, they're having three kids by the time they're, the mother is 28 or something like that. I mean, that's something that you wouldn't see uh, generally on a, a major population, a cosmopolitan city on the coast. Um, and so... You would see differences, if that were the the main explanation, you would see differences in safety culture. And you see some of that. But I mean, like in the neighborhood I live in, there's a whole, it's it's like a historic neighborhood. There's a whole degree of socioeconomic levels in the neighborhood. And there's just, it's it's very difficult to find lots of children outside playing. Um, And even even with those, those levels there, and I think that, um, so I think it, that's that's one possible contributing factor, but um, it's not. Uh, it can't be the whole th- the whole ex- explanation, because even here, you know, I try to get my kids to go outside, but um, they don't want to because there isn't an outdoor culture like there used to be. I mean, I knew I would miss something. I knew I was going to miss something if I didn't go outside, um, and they will miss something if they go outside because. You know, there's computers and there's, um, you know, streaming and, you know, there's a whole lot of alternatives that can keep them inside. So I think that's another part of it is that 
you know, before there wasn't any there wasn't any m- mechanism, and you sort of alluded to that a little bit in terms of being wealthy, um, to to dote on children to be helicopter parents. Um, the tools to do that have become um, much more available, and uh, and so I think that's another possibility. Is and, and that you know goes to the whole the whole explanation of you know and. There's still this debate out there. Did, did Zoom um, enable the pandemic um, response that we had? And I think that I think there's a lot there, there's a lot to that. The technology became um, matched what the culture wanted to do, and uh, it basically took it in that direction. Whereas it wasn't wouldn't it have been possible. So, Steve, you experienced on a broader scale in the social world the same thing or something analogous to what happened to you at your local daycare. And you learn something about the opaqueness, let's say, of the general population or maybe even of the human mind to to scientific research. I mean, whatever we might be as human beings, we're not, it's not easy to make us into scientists. And so what did you learn on that front? Yeah, so it seemed to me like people really wanted to be um, given certainty in things that were not necessarily certain or fully known, and they don't want to um, leave things up to chance. And like I said, they want risks reduced to um, to zero, um, which in any case can't can't be done. Um, I'd see this with <clears throat> you know uh, the the local schools. Um, sometimes um, my children would come home and tell me, you know, even things that weren't mandated. By the school, they were doing extra, extra me- taking extra measures. You know, they were like dousing them with hand sanitizer. Um, you know, hand sanitizer is not something that's um, proven to be effective, on, um, especially for respiratory viruses. It doesn't even actually work that well for other types of viruses, like GI viruses, which you would want it to be more effective for that than hand washing. So I mean, all these measures. They, they, the another thing they they made them do was they could not play with each other unless they were in the same class. So even when they were outside at recess, they had to distance themselves from the other classes. So if my my daughter had friends in another class, they couldn't interact with each other. And um, you know, out, yeah. outside for how long? For how long was that? For how long was that policy in place? Yeah, probably a a, a whole year. Um, and so I, I was I was asked at some point to be on a um, advisory board for the local school district, and I think one of the reasons I was asked is because I had talked to the medical director of our um, county health department and had become kind of friendly with him. And even though we disagreed with some things on um, in public, um, you know, there wasn't as much disagreement, and we were, you know, still became. Um, fairly friendly with one another, discussing things that were happening. But uh, he recommended um, to the superintendent that I be on this board because a lot of the people, other people were local physicians and community people who would never really deviate from what they were being told um, by the CDC and other organizations. And so um, they actually did want um, somebody who was contrarian to kind of challenge what was what was being mandated and what was being done in the schools. So um, that was a pretty good opportunity, although, um, you know, you really encounter the cautiousness of people, especially physicians, you know. I mean, they are used to being, uh, avoiding caution, uh, being very cautious and avoiding any sort of risk in their practices um, because they're afraid of malpractice and, you know, they've been sort of conditioned to think that way. Um, And so um, it was kind of a tall order to be able to convince them that a lot of these measures were hurting children and not actually um, making them safer. And we're really only there in sort of a theatrical way um, to to give people this sort of illusion or appearance of safety. And I started writing, I had been writing um, for the local paper um, on some of these issues uh, about especially how children were treated. And... um, Obviously, those weren't going over well. Um, but then some of the writing started to get picked up um, on a national level, 
And one of the reasons is, you know, I started really putting together um, evidence and compiling it for things like masks, uh, especially in, in a child population, um, which there was really no evidence that they would make a difference in schools. Um, and there was no consensus prior to the pandemic that they would play um, an important role in pandemic mitigation. You could go back and read papers um, for 10 years before and, uh, and really see that just by, just by looking at the, the, the publications, even up until you know, the beginning of the pandemic, there was really no consensus about um, whether masks would work for the population, much less for children. So I put together a lot of um, evidence and gave some presentations to the, uh, the physicians and the other people and, um, you know, I think it had an effect, but in the end, the governor sort of overrode all of the local district's power because, um, you know, they had mandates for masks tied to things like, um, you know, the ability of classrooms to operate with, you know, six feet of separation between children, which was impossible. Right. right. And then um, if they were masked, they would have— And arbitrary. Uh, completely arbitrary. Um, if there were th if they were masked, then they could have three feet, which is actually doable. So um, six feet was was something that schools didn't have the space to do, and so that was essentially a mask mandate without actually calling it um, a mask mandate. But anyway, because I put together these things, it really became useful to write about them, and and uh, and, and it, uh, it ended up getting some some national. Attention getting picked up by certain outlets like Brownstone Institute and other outlets that um, a lot of people read. And uh, so that's how I kind of got from the local level to a little bit more a national um, exposure and, uh, you know, ultimately to the point where I had enough to, to write a book. When did your book come out? Yeah, it came out in April. So it's been out less than, less than two months. And how's it doing? It got a really good push, um, it, and one of the reasons is because I have a lot of, I've made a lot of friends. Um, you know, uh, Jay Bhattacharya talked with you about this. Uh, you know, the prevalence of social media is is a, a curse and a um, a blessing um, because it can really put people together that uh, would normally not be able to to find each other. And so I've met a lot of people through social media and through my writing. Um, that uh, has really sort of formed a, a community and given me a lot of other opportunities. Um, I was involved in, you know, writing a document that you talked about with uh, Jay, which we call the Norfolk Group document, um, a, uh, questions for a COVID-19 commission that is being used by um, people in Congress. Um, I was invited to be on uh, a public health integrity committee for uh, Florida, uh, appointed by the governor um, DeSantis and the Surgeon General. So because of all these connections, um, you know, when I when I released the book, I could ask a lot of people to retweet it and, you know, write a little bit about it. And so I have a lot of connections that way. So I think that really translated into a, a pretty nice push at the beginning. Um, obviously, doing things like being on your podcast uh, will help tremendously uh, as well. So I haven't got the sales numbers yet, but I think it's I think it's doing okay. So so there there's some optimism in what you just described. I mean, you 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 have attempted to voice a uh, a contrarian opinion, let's say, although one that increasingly appears to be in accordance with anything with 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 common sense and with the facts on the ground. I think that's got to the point now where that's indisputable, unless you're completely off off your rocker. So that's a positive thing. And and here's another mystery, you know. I I I I think that what we did during the pandemic was unforgivable. However, we did stop doing it. And it isn't exactly clear to me why. You know, given everything we've talked about, given the joy that people had, like my, my sense in Canada, especially in Toronto, which is my home city, was that 70% of people who lived in Toronto would have been perfectly happy. They would have worn a mask for the rest of their lives without making a peep. 
And half of them would have been happy about it just because it would have given them an opportunity to inform and spy on their neighbors. And it was pretty appalling to see. But, you know, in the final analysis, we did back down, right? We backed off this and we have lifted the pandemic restrictions and requirements and we have returned to something approximating whatever the hell the new normal is, right? I mean, things are a lot less bizarre than they were during the lockdown. And like, why do you think it is that we moved back from the brink given all the push there was to put us in this authoritarian position to begin with? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, I think all of the the machinery of the pandemic response and is still there. Um, I think uh, you have to have a, a leadership class that has learned a lesson from what happened, and I'm not really sure that that's that's the case um, because you can see it. Um, you know, there are some areas where they there is some concession of harms of the pandemic response. You know, you see people running away from the idea that we should have closed schools, um, even to the point of pretending that they never advocated for it, such as like Randy Weingarten of the American Federation of Teachers. Um, you know, you see that happening. It's sort of a tacit admission that there are certain things that people will actually understand were very, very harmful. Um, but at the same time, it's still not enough um, to have that sort of underlying admission. There has to be a real accounting of what happened and, and, and why it happened. And I think, you know, some of that's happening on the political level with uh, COVID commissions and the U.S. Congress and in other, other countries. Um, but it's going to be kind of a long haul because there's a lot of people who will want to sort of control how the history is told in a way that... Um, kind of whitewashes the the harms of, of what was done. So has the fact that we did retreat from the authoritarian controls that were implemented, has that restored a certain degree of optimism to you? It, it, it doesn't exactly sound like it. I mean, the argument that you just made seems to be, if I've got this right, that you think that it wouldn't take a lot of provocation for the same kind of hammers to come down again. But th that does beg the question: Why? Why do you think it? Why do you think it was lifted? I mean, we we kind of made an arbitrary decision in some ways that the pandemic was over, and I don't understand why we reverted back to something approximating normality. Well, I mean, was it finally that enough people got got tired of it? People like Jay Bhattacharya and and started to make enough noise so that there was some pushback. It just took people a while to get organized. It was because enough people got infected is what I think. Um, you know, you have these really highly transmissible variants like Omicron that were actually quite um, not as severe as uh, they're, you know, not as severe as the earlier variants. And they just spread like wildfire. And I mean, it's been shown that if you're on the edge of a pandemic and you haven't experienced it, your anxiety and fear levels are much, much higher in the population because they're getting their information from the news and they're getting their information from the media in a way that's not comforting um, because the media relies on advertisements and clicks and things like that. Um, so the fear level, when you're not exposed to the actual pathogen, is quite high. But then once it's, once it's actually burned through the population, um, and people have gotten it, whether they were vaccinated or not, um, you, they start to see the reality of what the actual risk was. Um, you know, it burns through their entire family, their parents get it. They might even be have some comorbidities. They might be 80 years old or whatever, and they did fine. I mean, um, so you have enough people like that, that even though they sort of bought the story on the idea of... Um, sort of distorted risk that everybody had. Um, the reality of being infected and having that direct exposure uh, lessened the fear and the willingness to go along. Um, but I think, you know, so, I mean, if some, if some pa pandemic happened right now, I think there'd be a lot of pushback um, because we're so close to what happened with the COVID-19 pandemic. But I do think that there's going to be you know, an official story 
that has to be uh, more correct than incorrect. And I think that's, a, that's gonna be a fight that's gonna go on for a while. So, well, so part of what you've concluded actually is somewhat optimistic and because your conclusion seems to be that once the facts of the severity of the illness were actually thoroughly and, and tangibly accessible, because so many people ended up with COVID, they weren't hypothesizing it anymore, that we had enough grounding in our civil rights tradition to return to to normality, right? So once the fear did decrease to a somewhat normal level, we didn't find the attractions of the authoritarian lockdown sufficient to continue in that direction. So there is some optimism in that, right? Yeah. We, reverted, we reverted back to being a free society. There, there is, I mean, but you still see hints of things that um, are sort of left over, like drives to, uh, you know, I've read articles about, you know, eliminating, there's been several of them like this, eliminating um, all respiratory viruses from the air of buildings based on their ventilation and filtering and engi building engineering, basically. And, uh, you know, I mean, what, one, thing we, one thing we witnessed when kids had finally been um, in in-person schools is that they were getting lots of viruses. I mean, um, influenza, adenovirus, RSV, these things spiked. And sometimes it was even in the summer outside of their normal seasons um, because these endemic viruses had been suppressed. And uh, it, wor it, wor it actually, the separation and distancing worked better for those endemic viruses than they did for the pandemic virus itself. And so the idea of, you know, eliminating respiratory viruses from the air that we breathe, I think is uh, is not right. I think it's a dangerous idea. And uh, um, much like people who thought when antibiotics came out that you could just give everybody an antibiotic and for anything, um, that uh, there would be no downside to that. Now, of course, we know that there is. So um, I think there's a lot of, of sort of hubris that's still out there about um, you know eliminating risk even from sort of everyday infections that I think is is going to take a while to to go away. Yes, well, the part part of the hubris is that we don't understand that the demand to re risk to reduce risk to zero is a cardinal form of risk, right? Because it requires a kind of impossible totalitarian overreach. It's probably the case when we're agitating for zero anything. You know, because I think the same thing with regard to the war on drugs. I think the same thing with regards to net zero on the climate front. It's like, no, you're mitigating one form of risk, but you're radically increasing another form of risk. And it's obvious that that's what we did with the pandemic. Is there anything else you want to bring to the attention of our viewers and listeners before we close out? We've been talking, I'll just let everybody know, we've been talking to Steve Templeton today about his book, Fear of a Microbial Planet, How a Germophobic Safety Culture Makes Us Less Safe. And so you can obviously pick up that book and walk through Steve's argument in more detail. Is there anything else that you think people should know that we haven't covered or are we at a point where we can reasonably uh, begin to bring this to a close? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, just... Uh when you ask something about how do you respond to this, how do you how do you fix things? Um, that's obviously a very difficult question. But you know, some of the things that we've lost in the previous three years, um, you know, like our communities, um, our education of our children, um, the ability to sort of challenge them, which has gone on for much longer in terms of a safety culture. I mean, it's important to try to try to reverse some of that, and I think that uh, um, that could go a, a long way um, to to making things better. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a difficult. Huh, as we said earlier, we don't understand the preconditions, all the preconditions that were in place to allow children to roam and range more freely than they do now, and so it's very difficult to figure out what we would have to return to, let's say, or approach in order 
for that to, to occur again. I mean, to some degree, encouraging parents to understand that fostering independence in their kids is the, mo is the proper risk-free approach. I mean, people can learn that. And I wrote about that a fair bit in my, especially in my book, 12 Rules for Life, um, encouraging parents to understand that they can be the biggest risk to their children because of their hyper-concern with safety. Absolutely, and that's the message, is that, you know, this paradoxical um, safety culture makes actually children less safe, less prepared to face the world and less prepared to deal with any sort of threat, whether it's microbial or, you know, arguments in college with people they disagree with. I mean, a lot of these things are, are related. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's always one risk or another. It's never no risk. Absolutely, and a trade. So, and and that is a hard. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. All right. Well, for everyone watching and listening on YouTube and associated platforms, thank you very much for your time and attention. To Dr. Steve Templeton, author of Fear of a Microbial Planet, thank you very much for talking to me today. We're going to go over to the Daily Wire Plus platform now. I'm going to talk to Steve for an additional half an hour about the development of his interest in immunology. And uh, if you'd like to join us there, that would be just fine. Otherwise, thank you very much, Dr. Templeton. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, thank you for the book and congratulations on its success. And Hopefully the message that you're attempting to distribute will be picked up and there'll be some positive consequence of that. Thank you, it's been an honor to chat with you. Hello everyone. I would encourage you to continue listening to my conversation with my guest on dailywireplus.com.